welcome to AIL TV I, and welcome to the big interview. In our last interview, I was talking to Mr. Alam, or no, Professor Alam Ahmed. I keep, I, I should just use that title properly. You see, the time that we have is so constrained is that it's very little that we can cover, although we can actually cover it in a clever way to seem that we have covered so much. But in this video, I want to talk to him about the work he does with the young people, the youth. Because what I have seen, he has managed to bring in these young people from Sudan, from Eritrea, and, and bring them together, come and discuss their career path. Uh, to, they try to find out where do they want to go after school or after they have finished college. But mo also, I will be able to feature some of the work that uh, he has done because I've got them on record, so you can see. Um, you see, people will talk about the youth, and when people talk about the youth, even when they meet, I don't see, I don't hear what is actually, where are the youth trying to go? What do they do? And what are they doing now to better themselves? Because I have seen just an example. We will show some videos of you bringing all these uh, young, young Sudanese, Eritreans from Ireland, from everywhere, from around the country. Why are you so much interested in the youth? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Always a pleasure to see you, to meet you, to talk to you. And you're doing a great work here. Now, I am interested in the youth because the whole world for a long time has said that. Uh, all the people who they did research on social science, on uh, sport and recreation, on futurist, the people who talk about the future uh, foresight, about how the world will look like, all of them agreed on their the people who will lead the, the or all of them agreed we should focus and invest all our energy and resources on developing our youngest generation. And I think if I summarize, there's two main reasons. All people think about the same two reasons. One of them, technology and the real revolution happened in information or in ICT or what we call it now digital transformation happened in the last 20 years, around 20 to 30 years. So this whole revolution in technology, smartphone, uh, internet, and so on, took place in the last 20 to 25 years uh, from now. And if you go back, like myself or yourself, Joseph, or others, if you go back 20, 25 years, you are an, a mature adult. So 25 years ago, I was 25 or 26, 27 years old. At the time, so when I, I finished my school, I went to university, I never had a mobile phone. Not because I was from Africa or in Sudan, but even people here in the UK, they didn't have a mobile phone. Saudi Arabia, they didn't have a mobile phone. So we did not really grow up or we did not have technology enhancing, like now I'm talking to you from my laptop, you're talking to me from your laptop or mobile. This was not the case. So those who can, the future is technology, the future is digital revolution, the future is something called smart uh, people, the future is called data science, the future is called artificial intelligence, and all these things are associated to something called information. So if we go back to the whole world, the whole world, we all, in South Africa, in America, in Canada, we went through three revolutions. This is the history of how we developed or how we reached where we are now. So we started a long time ago, uh, and then we went through a, a second phase in our development, and then we are now in this last stage. So if you go back, the first revolution we all went through, like Germany, Africa, everyone, is called industrialization. So all countries went through industrialization, like Germany, they created the car, they built the, the ships, they built aircraft, and so on. And then from 
industrialization, we went through something called information. And we are in a globalization era now. The problem is not all countries went through this revolution the same. So Germany went through industrialization. They are one of the best industrialized countries in the world. But if you compare that to the entire African countries, it's not. So in the middle, we went through something called information revolution. So who witnessed this? I witness it, you witness it, but me and you, we witness this quite late in our 20th, 30th years old. And there are some people who witness the information revolution in their 40s. But the kids who they witness it is my daughter and your daughter and others, because they were born around that age, 30 years ago. So they are the one who witness the real revolution in the whole human being or humankind transformation. Now, that's why we, I am, and many others, and I think the whole world, the United Nations, World Bank, everyone, is focusing, is focusing, is focusing on these young generations. Number two, and I will uh, uh, finish here, is that it's proven that youngest generations, they have the ability and the capability to bring new ideas. They are creative. So my daughter is more creative than myself because her mind is full of uh, smartphone ideas. She doesn't have to worry about how much she has to work in order to bring food to this table. She doesn't have to worry about her other sister or, or brothers because I am the one who take care of them and so on and so forth. She doesn't have to worry too much about discrimination at work, promotion, and so on, about who is paying the bill here. So everyone in the whole world, poor or rich, youngest generations are more likely or high likely to have better ideas, fresh ideas, new ideas, creativity. So for those two reasons, that's why I'm focusing on them. On the yours, because I think the future is on those yours. And we have to make sure we can prepare them to lead us. So what I'm doing really is to prepare my daughter and all the youngest so they will lead us sooner, not later. And one example is our uh, Chancellor of Exchequer. He's only 39, 39 year old. He's not even 40. He's leading the economy of one of the, of the top world lead economies. He's led by a 39 year old, uh, if you like, um, chap. So that's why I think we need to prepare our youngest generation to take these leading roles because they will do it better. I have tried, and or I will say we tried, particularly in the World Association for Sustainable Development and in the, or actually in all of the institutions I belong to, so the knowledge or the Middle East Knowledge Economy Institute. So when we go to any conference, mostly the people who are subscribed, they submit papers are from my age or senior academic or uh, professionals. So every year we try to give chance to young generations to attend. Every place we've been hosted by a university, we try to work very closely with the university so that youngest generation can actually be involved. The least to say is for them to attend. And to give you one example, in 2010, this is two, 10 years ago, our uh, conference, international conference was hosted by Stockton University at, in New Jersey in the United States. And maybe this is an opportunity to say again, one of our founding members who is in advisory board, uh, he has uh, been tremendous, uh, instrumental in hosting that conference in, in the US in 2010 by, say, by trying his best to engage the youngest generation. So when we went to Stockton in New Jersey, we have been shown at the opening ceremony in the evening, sorry, at the reception in the evening, they brought lots of students, youngest generation, maybe 20 or 30, and they said to all of us, the participants, those or these are the, 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 the real organizers who organize everything. So the conference organizing committee, they were, although the, 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 the vice chancellor, the president, his deputy, uh, Professor Michael Hop uh, Bussler, all of them are involved but those kids were the driving force for organizing the conference. And I have seen that in Bahrain, Ahliya University, full of young generations leading. You have seen them with me in Bahrain yourself. 
We have seen that in many places. So uh, we, we, we became more aware of the aspirations and the understanding of the young generations across the world from Middle East, Africa, America, Canada. In Canada also, we had them in Montreal. We try to understand uh, how they all behave and what is their aspiration. And I think they all agree. There is a common factor among the youngest generation, whether they are from the Middle East, America, uh, Africa, or Australia, or all over the place, they do agree on democracy. They do agree on an equality. They do love each other. They don't hate each other. They are much better than us in terms of loving each other. They do appreciate each other. They do love creativity. They all like innovation. They all like to think about out of the box. They all like the world to be a better place. They all like to have to see the world green. They don't like violence. They don't like terrorism. This is common across all the youngest I have seen. Now, bringing them together is, uh, has always been an exciting opportunity to see how they mix. But interestingly, Joseph, and I'm telling you this, whether they are from South Africa or in Dubai, for example, I was a judge in the Global Youth Forum 2017. There were 111 or 110 youngest from all over the world, it's Russia, uh, Botswana, Sudan, America, whatever it is, UAE. Interestingly enough, if you bring them, they will click together very quickly because they share everything, not like us. So you, 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 you bring them, within hours, they have made friends. Within hours, they know who is living in that room, where they share. Okay, I will wait for you. You sit with me in the bus and so on. Not like the, the oldest generation. Within hours, they have exchanged uh, uh, Snapchats, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Facebook account, not like us. The oldest generation, they may not even have Facebook. They may not even have WhatsApp. Within hours, they communicate in WhatsApp. So they start following each other. So it is always really great to see them mixing together and so on. So yes, we did. And I'm very pleased to say the, uh, I don't want to mention names, so I will might miss one. But for example, from the UK, we have seen many diaspora, really, really good youngest generations. From Africa, I have seen from, for example, the one really stood out for me is one from Sudan and one from uh, Zimbabwe. The girl from Zimbabwe, she got the best award for uh, in the competition from the Global Youth in 2017 because she got such a creative idea. I remember there's a couple of girls from Russia, UAE. I remember Suad. She's a brilliant girl. She's big. I was surprised when she told me she's big fluently Korean language. And I told her, how did you learn that? She said to me, because in, in UAE, I work in the hospital. It's, it's a Korean uh, partnership, blah, blah, blah. And in order to do my work, I have to learn Korean. I was so amazed with the way they mix together. I met people from America from uh, Europe, really. Okay, you know, now I'm gonna go back again to, uh, to the three organizations. In the first interview, you mentioned something very, very, very important, where I haven't, I haven't heard that mentioned before, uh, that when you talk about uh, 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 sustainable development, people jump on Africa, thinking that, you know, we need water there, we need I don't know what, but they don't actually realize that the, the, these problems are global, but in, in different ways. But the question now is this, because you have hosted your conferences all over the world, is that strategic or you want to, or what is it exactly? Why do you have to take these uh, conferences all over the world? Excellent, excellent question. I like that question. We always believe sustainable development or our slogan, or we believe that we have to think globally and act locally. So we all want climate change to come down. We don't want global warming to happen everywhere. Because if I can clean the UK, if I can clean London, I'm going to travel next week to Sudan. I will face the music. 
I want to try, I will travel next week to say America, I will have another issue. So when we talk like the issues about discrimination in your, in your other interview, I want the whole world to be clean from discrimination, not necessarily in, in London or in New York or in America or Minneapolis, no. So yes, strategically, we are very, very keen. And that's why the United Nations said that in a couple of times, they like the organizations we do because we are not just focusing on Europe. We are not just trying to connect Europe. It could have been an easy task for me to focus in Europe. Today we are in London, tomorrow we are in Germany, the day after we are in Spain. All Europeans are the same. They have all the technology, everything is easier to organize it, but it's a real challenge to organize it across the world. So we want it, yes, to answer your question, strategically, we want it to go all over the world because we want to go and see how people are handling issues locally. We want to learn about what they do, how they teach, how they treat their kids, how they treat women, how they, the government is behaving, how public policy is being uh, formulated, how what food they eat, how they handle issues. And that exactly the, the driving force behind us going from place to place. So we have been to United Arab Emirates, we have been to Bahrain, we have been to Italy, we have been to uh, Canada, America, we have been to Australia, we have been to every place. And that's uh, Turkey, we have been, of course, the UK, but everywhere we go, we learn more and more and more. So now we know the culture in Bahrain. Now, for example, just to give you an example about Bahrain, for example. What did I learn in Bahrain, particularly, and also associated very much with the youngest generation? I learned, no matter how you are different in terms of your ideology or the way you're thinking about particular societal issues or values, you can still live in harmony and in peace. And in Bahrain, um, I think you have seen that by yourself when you joined us in Bahrain, um, uh, Joseph, in 2017, the, the Bahraini youngest uh, at the university, they formulated something called Together Safe. I like the title, it's called Together. That means we all together. What do they mean by together? Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Coptic, whatever it is. What do they mean by together? Black, white, and so on. But they went further. What do they mean by together? They, they mean about the consultant and the cleaner the professor and the cleaner, together mean everyone. And the example they gave us, and that's why I really admire what they have done, they said the students in this initiative called Together Safe, they went to the hospital, for example, and they brought gifts, lots of gifts. And then they will come to you, Alam, imagine I am a cleaner in, in a hospital in Bahrain. They will come to you and say, hello, Joseph, we are the students here studying medicine we are giving you this gift to just to say thank you for all your work you have been doing, which made our life easier. You made ours, we would never have enjoyed the experience of the hospital. We would never have learned well if you are not being doing your job perfectly. We are here to say thank you. So they're giving them gift, saying to him thank you for the job he's doing, which in another way meaning I do appreciate your job. Yes, you are a cleaner, but so what? Cleaner is a job, and so on. And if you look back to all religions, prophets or all religions, the, the story of all prophets, they were not professors, they were not consultants, they were very basic people. So this is where I think the strategy to go everywhere to learn. And if we haven't done that, we would never have learned Australia, which will run short of water during the summer season. We will never have learned uh, from, uh, what is it, in Canada, how polite on the street people they respect, uh, they are willing to help you. In Montreal, we will never have learned how cold is uh, Toronto, because we went during the summer, and one guy was telling us during the winter season, we asked them, for example, in Toronto, in Canada, because you notice if you go to Canada, in Toronto, you will see that shopping malls or, or big shopping malls are connected through different uh, layers of uh, corridors or you call it uh, walking uh, closed uh, corridors 
with the station. The reason for that, because during winter time, you can't walk from the station to the shopping mall because the freezing or the snow is like this kind of inches. So you learn many things, how people are dealing with. We learn in Canada without seeing it. And I said, okay, if the inch, if you have such a large amount of snow during winter, how would you survive? They said in Canada, you are responsible, Joseph, in front of your house, from the from the way your house starts until it finishes on the street, you have to clean that every time the snow comes down, falls down. So imagine if we do this in the UK, you have to clean. Imagine in countries where we are struggling with cleaning our street, like in Sudan or Africa. Imagine you just clean in front of your house. That means you will clean the whole city. That so you learn I so many, many basic ideas, not in textbook. While other countries have found solutions, in Africa we are still having problems, maybe because, you know, I used to think that 60 years of independence is enough to do, to do everything and to understand. I have come to realize that it is very, very difficult. And I used really to have harsh comments about why are we not progressing. But now I can see that, first of all, we are struggling with democracy. So that, that, that problem alone, we haven't actually understood what is real, what is real democracy means. But, but okay, this is, again, this is just a personal question. Maybe this is, uh, I, just want to, I just want you to see it this way. You have got now a lot of knowledge. And I'm sure you can even take a job of advising people at the UN or at the African Union. If you were to apply for a job in those two organizations, what, what kind of job would you apply? Because I, I will be the first one to sign the door. <laughs> this is very interesting. I think the one which gives too much money. No, I know this is... Uh, I, I, would, I would really love, uh, Joseph, to be involved at, uh, at, uh, at, at a worldwide level, really doing the things I, I strongly believe uh they will change our life for the better i would really like to be advocate worldwide i would love to have funding where i don't need uh to be restricted of what i can do for example you asked me about bringing youngest generations together now i can bring youngest generations together in 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 a, in a focal point say in egypt in the north of africa like in uh Tunisia or in Egypt or in Morocco and in the south, in South Africa, in the middle, maybe in Kenya or somewhere. But to do that, I need to have money. So I can't enjoy the, way, the job I, I, I will dream of. I would love to have a job where it can give me access to good designers, good web developers, good video producer like yours, who can, I can have six, seven, eight people, because I believe 100% a message can well can can be well received and used by the young generation if it is in like the what you do now a video or a, or more of a video produced uh, message will reach at least 60 or 70 percent more than a written one but for me to design these messages to get engaged with people like the work you do i know it because i have done it i am not an expert or a highly professional person like you in the production of these TV or video pro programs, but at least I know how difficult and very expensive to get this to be done. But at the same time, if we can do them, we will solve many problems. Imagine terrorism, hate crime, discrimination. We can use technology, we can use uh, Snapchats, we can use video production, particularly video production, but this is very expensive. So, but the other thing is, I would love to have a job where people, they actually do my work, because it's not good you spend time doing the work and no one actually implementing it. So I think if you find a job where you can be a real change maker, that will be the best job. And to be a real change maker, I think is not just what you believe and what you think you can do or what you think if you do it will change people's life, but it's really finding the environment 
which will really help you to change things. Imagine I told you in your other interview that for the black academia, we have to go to the prime minister, say to him, we strongly believe you are keen to help us, but you have failed to help us because you, you have done or you have gone the wrong way. This is the right way. But I would love to, if he already got the enablers to make that happening, I would love to find uh, a peaceful environment where we can do that. But really one thing very important, I really, really want a job where we can really live in peace and harmony. You progress, you enjoy life. If your income is 1,000, why not your income is becoming 3,000? If I can be in that position, I would really be very happy. If I can make people happy. <clears throat> and I remember in the United Arab Emirates, I was talking to people many years ago about the importance of happiness for well-being. A happy person can take right decisions. And guess what, Joseph? After many years of what I have said in UAE back in 2009, and before that in a conference, even the United Nations, the World Bank, now we have something called World Happiness Report. Can tell you which country is happier than the others. UAE is one of the first countries to have a minister. It's a girl. She's been named Minister for Happiness. It's a job now in UAE. So yes, why not? But to make someone happy, it's not you give him money, but to enable him, to listen to him, to make him comfortable with his color, to make him comfortable with his skin, to make him comfortable when he go to the job. If you go to your workplace and you're not happy, you're not going to produce the best of you. So I think uh, a job where it gives you a chance to deliver all this is very difficult. But uh, it, I can do this from every platform, as an academic, as in the UN, in governments, in everywhere. But it's just uh, the, the, the whole world is shrinking now. You know that. Professor Alam, you know, I want to play a short video of basically this video is saying thank you. And you will, you will explain the meaning of Musharak. Okay. Remember? Remember that one? So we're going to pause maybe just for uh, one minute or two minutes. We'll play that video. In 2009, Professor Alam Ahmed was appointed to lead the Department of Municipal Affairs, DMA, a major knowledge management project, also known as Musharak, the first of its kind in Abu Dhabi and the Middle East. The objectives of Musharak were to identify, capture useful and valuable knowledge, classify and store knowledge, deliver relevant knowledge in a simple, fast, efficient and at the right time to relevant users, maintain the information life cycle and ensure information secure through process and policies. Other benefits of Mosharak or DMA and the municipalities include support the process of decision making, documenting the lessons learned from earlier projects and initiatives, development of skills and capabilities, increase innovation, better service to residents of Abu Dhabi, more efficient operations and faster problem solving. Okay, Musharak. You see, this, this one is going to lead us to McKay again because you have done a lot of work in the Middle East. And uh, I, I wonder, because I, I always hear about Arabs also being discriminative and uh, a lot of stories, but they happen to actually to embrace you. Is that because of the language you speak or because of the knowledge that you have in your field that you do? Because when, when, we, when we see that Musharak, it's a, it's a very deep video and uh, it explains the work that you have done there. Just talk about this a little bit. Your work in the Middle East. Uh, thank you, Mervin. Uh, yeah, it remind me of this video. Yeah, I remember which one. I, okay. Now, I think, yes, the language was one factor because when I went there, I remember my colleagues, most of them are from the UK. They were struggling to get the staff at the government to deal with them because there were two issues. I think the language and the, and the culture. 
And I think most Arab culture is similar, and most African culture is similar. So that gave me some advantage. But the other important thing, I think, when I went to the Middle East, when I went to United Arab Emirates, I I, uh, I was advisor or I was uh, founding uh, projects or I wanted to help them. So when I was trying, when I was helping them, I have continuously been emphasizing they know the same like me or even better. The only difference, I just been called Professor Alam Ahmed coming from the UK. But they are highly educated people. The, the, those I found in the, in the, uh, the government working at, at Abu Dhabi, they were all very educated. Some of them actually studied at Harvard University. I have seen people having courses from Harvard Business Review, sorry, Business School, uh, from Oxford, from London, from Australia, New Zealand, and so on and so on. That's number one. But the thing which I think I managed to get through, and I still, some of them contact me, and they said to me, Alan, without you keep reminding us. I was telling them, all of them, I said to them, there is nothing wrong by being a rich person or a rich country. UAE population is very limited. I, don't, I think at that time they were less, less than 1 million. But they have a massive oil. This is a fact about UAE. Very little people and massive amount of oil. So that means they are a very rich country. There's no question about that. But the important thing, I was reminding them, the founder or the father, I think, for the whole uh, UAE, and is being considered as an iconic leader in the whole Arab countries, and I think beyond the Arab countries, he's the equivalent of Mandela, is Sheikh Zayed, who is the founder of all UAE legacy, if you like. Now, I say to them, Sheikh Zayed, if you take, if he's alive now, he would have said to you, listen to what Alam is saying. Yes, you have the money. Every one of you is having a house, big house. Every one of you is having good salary, good income, blah, blah, blah. And we are making this UAE the best beast on earth. But he will have said to you, still, you need to continue learning and development. So I was in emphasizing on this word. No matter how rich you are, no matter how luxury life you are enjoying in Abu Dhabi, you still need to be reminded, and I was reminding them on a daily basis, you need to continue learn and develop yourself. So the fact you have done the master's degree, okay, what is next? That's why uh, I think it is one of the countries across the whole world, during the lockdown, they were able to still manage the government system because it is robustly been designed to operate at the time of crisis. And that was a fact. Many people from UAE told me this during the last two months. That's number one. Number two, sorry, number three, is that I have always treated them and I asked them as much as possible to treat me uh, as a friend, as a colleague. Yes, I'm a professor. Um, so that big status or that prestigious name, yes, use that one whenever is necessarily. But at the end of the day, I am just a humble person sitting in that office. I am a normal person. I have my old changi, I have my daughters, I have family, I have friends. I am just a normal person. So I, I try to minimize, to minimize every day of that hierarchy of uh, professor, the guy from America, they can see me, they see me on TV, they see me on the newspaper. He, he's got so many books and so on, no. That's in my profession. And I will continue to work. I will continue to publish work. I will talk in conferences. But at the end of the day, I keep or I kept saying to them, I want you to be a friend with me. I, I am really here to learn with you, from you. We want to be friends because I can't survive without you. Treat me as a friend. And I think that was, was, the, was the starting kicking point. And I started sitting down with them, those who they smoke cigarette outside the building. I go and for example, there was a group of people who they can, you can only chat with them informally if you go to them at the time they're having their smoke outside the building. So I used to take, to look from my window at the top, and whenever I see them downstairs smoking, I will go down and chat with them, and so on. And also I learned a lot. That's about 
And I kept telling them, uh, I, I, I realized there's so many, they also have so many social problems. They do have many challenges the same like us. You know, there's things where there's no poor or rich. There's things where there's no Arab or African or British. Good, good, good example is the COVID-19. We all into this the same. COVID-19 is frightening everyone. So I managed to discover uh, to discover lots of COVID-19 20 years ago, or not 20, 10 years ago, I was able to find out things which exactly like COVID-19, uh, and we just have to help. They need my help, socially, emotionally. Some of them, they were senior director of, of departments. And I kept telling them, yes, you are a head of department, you have a master from London. Why not you do the next one? Because now you have the money, now you have the time, now you have a government, the Crown Prince, he's saying to them, any unlimited, you can go and study anywhere you like. So the Crown Prince is giving them unlimited support to study. And I said to them, look, even in my country, in the UK, no one is giving us unlimited fund to study. My daughter, I have to pay for her money. So I was trying to tease them and tease them. I never stopped short. Even saying that in, in front of ministers, everything. But I think the bottom line is respect. I have always respected them as, as human beings, as decent people. Uh, I have always respected them because they so much valued me. They respected me. So this is, I think, was the keys. But yes, go back to the first part of your question. The language and the lecture and, and the culture, they were critical. But uh, I think the core of that is to treat them as human beings. So I respect them, but I'm not respecting them because they are rich. I'm not respecting them because they are my employer. I'm not respecting them because the salary they're giving me is three, four times my salary here. But I'm respecting them because they are very good. They are very good human being. Whether I still have friends from UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. So, and the same like you have friends from America, from. So if I look into my social network, I have Beverly. She's a close friend of mine. I know her for many years. I know Michael Bosler, the one I mentioned to you, but the same thing I know people from UAE, from Saudi. So I think if we all treat each other as human being, so that human factor, I, I would love if someone like the X factor create a competition called human factor. So why not, why not we have a competition on human factor? So our kids will line up the Wembley or the O2 arena not competing on who can sing better for Simon Cow, and I will give this as through your channel, maybe Simon Cow can sing, or maybe those other people from the TV. So we're giving them a free, a free idea now. So TV can think of human factor. Let's compete on human factor. Who is the greatest person having a change in his local area? Not just helping others, but treating others better. Just treating is important than helping. Maybe I have a money, I go and help my neighbor, but treating his so human factor or human blood so what is your uh, what is your plan now as in terms of uh, moving forward you, we know we've got covid-19 bring uh, putting a brakes on whatever we want to do but then again there is something good happening we can still meet we can still discuss what we learn from this covid-19 pandemic or the lockdown we have so many opportunities in our own organizations and we have so much resources, we never realize the potential of these resources. For example, COVID-19 lockdown helped us to meet and organize, I think many, I think probably 50 or 60 international debates. The reason being is with the COVID-19, everyone is staying at home. All our members and our uh, participants, they were able to come like what I'm doing now with you from their bedrooms and meet and discuss. In the past, it's so difficult to get one of the ministers. For example, Dr. Gail Rigobert, the Minister of Sustainable Development from San Lucia. To get Gail to come to a conference, it takes quite a lot of contacts. Her time, her BA will come back to our assistant 
okay, this one, this flight, not this flight. Oh, I can't do this because I have to come back to the to the Saloshi and so on. Now we have been able to get many, many busy people. Normally, it's very difficult to get them. So we have realized our network is there, but we didn't explore the opportunity of using the technology to bring them to speak. It's much million times better to the, for the whole world to listen to what we have brought in the last two months rather than they will not see them again for another two, three years because of the traveling. Number two, we also realize the diversity. You remember I told you in, in the other interview that when we created WAST, we created WAST because we wanted to bring people from a different background, different continent. Now we realize we are one of the very unique and very few organizations. We have experts in different, different fields. We have public health, engineering, transportation, politics, uh, in terms of countries, we have experts from Nigeria, Sudan, Egypt, America, all Europe, uh, Middle East, Saudi Arabia. So uh, startup innovation, Libya, we are being able to bring people from Libya despite this struggle in the ICT. And so on, we had one of the speaker, very smart guy from San Luis, speaking to us. So I think we learn, we have plenty of expertise and the plan, uh, Yodif, is to use this expertise. Now we are using it. We are starting doing it. In fact, on the 4th of, uh, of uh, next two, 10 days, we're starting a, a complete workshop online uh, on leadership, and then we're going to build on that. Uh, so the plan is to maximize the benefit of our network, to maximize the benefit of our knowledge base, to maximize the benefit of all our experts across the world for to benefit the rest of the world. Another thing also we plan is to try to engage more, if you like, more strategically with issues like women empowerment, with issues like discrimination. So we have run a whole day on Black Lives Matter, but what can we do? How can we link discrimination with sustainability? How can we link discrimination with combating issues like terrorism? How can we link Black Lives Matter issues to do with human rights. Yes, the, the law is clear, but how can we really instill a spirit in the law? So we have lawyers, we have people from legal backgrounds and so on and so forth. So we're really going to transform and to change the way we have been doing things for 20 years. And you will shortly see Joseph, lots of things uh, going to be done in a, in, a, in a completely different way. We're going to engage more people than we used to be in the past. And we have been doing this, particularly now we try this with Sudan. We've been involving lots of uh, key people in the decision making. Uh, we are giving more opportunity for the normal individual citizen. And by the way, this is the most important stakeholders, individual who are normal citizen. How can we let them talk about their opinion, about science, technology, innovation, about creativity, about everything? So I think that's, you will see, going. we, we, we were going to see us moving toward this direction, giving voices through our strong platform to those who are normal citizens, not necessarily by titles. I am very, very thankful that you have managed to have this time to come and talk to us here at AIL TV or Africans in London TV. We have got so much more to talk about. So I hope you will have another time again to come and speak to us. So for now, thank you very much. But as always, the conversation must continue. It, 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 it can be either on uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, whatever idea comes up, I am ready. Thank you very much, Joseph. I wish you all the best. I know you for many years, and you have been working uh, on these issues of promoting uh, and helping the diaspora generally. But yes, I know you focus more in Africa, but you generally. And I really hope if I can send one message here, not just to say thank you alone is not enough. But if we want to thank you, I think people, particularly the African, should really support the channel. At least promote your videos you have a massive number of videos and actually encourage even TV channels to try to explore what you have done over the many years. And I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. 
And I hope I have have not taken. I know I I talked a lot, uh, but I really hope <laughs> no, no, what as, I have said for that is one, We are not worried about that one. Thank you very much for having me here. Yes, I'm really yes, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. And that was uh, uh, Professor Alam Ahmed. He has got a lot to say, but uh, we are going actually to do something very good. We have, we have got videos of over maybe 50 hours of videos that we have actually made with him. So I believe that uh, one day we're going to make a special program or three programs out of it. You are going to see all the stuff that we have spoken about. Oh, I am just very happy. Thank you very much again. I'm surprised to hear that you are leaving. I enjoyed the little time we met and talked and I found you to be a decent person. I wish you success wherever you may go. Using his international network of experts, Professor Alam Ahmed introduced and organized more than 11 high-level KM seminars attended by more than 2,500 staff from DMA municipalities as well as almost 40 entities from across UAE.